The Kramer family had settled in to sleep in their cosy, secure house on a snowy night in early March 2010. But the calming silence of the middle of the night was interrupted with a hammer that came crashing through one of the downstairs windows. What followed was a savage and merciless attack that left the residents of the house in utter disbelief and resulted in tragedy. The survivor of the horrific slayings pointed to one person who became the key suspect. The problem was he had an alibi and it was absolutely airtight. This is Red Rum, stories about the true victims of crime. This show is made from various source documents listed in the show notes. I use news archives, documentary footage and court documents, and so the episodes are accurate to the source materials I can find. Find all episodes that are on YouTube as a podcast version if you prefer to listen on the go. Laurie and Jeffrey Kramer had been married in 1980 when Laurie was just 19 years old. Even though she was young, she knew that Jeffrey was the love of her life. Together, the couple had children, three of them. Anthony, Angela and Michael. Jeffrey was running his own business that towed vehicles and Laurie worked at a publishing house specialising in education. Laurie loved animals and spent her spare time gardening. Having a family and children of their own was what the couple had always wanted. When their youngest son Michael was a little bit older, he got a place at the Universal Technical Institute. He had big dreams of following in his father's footsteps and becoming a successful business person himself. And Angela had met and started dating a man called Steve. Tragically, Steve died in a motorbike accident. But after Steve's death, Angela sought comfort in his best friend Johnny. It wasn't long before Angela and Johnny started dating and eventually Angela became pregnant and the couple had a son. It was on Monday the 1st of March 2010 that the Kramer family had settled down to all go to sleep in their home. Angela was back staying at the family home. Anthony would be sleeping in the basement and Michael and his girlfriend who for this episode we're going to call Sarah, were going to be sleeping on the sofa in the living room. And Jeffrey and Laurie would be in their bed upstairs as usual. The night was normal. That was until 3.10am that following morning, Tuesday the 2nd of March, when 911 received a phone call from 25-year-old Angela Kramer. She was frantic and clearly very upset. Someone was in the house and they were shooting. She didn't know who it was, but she confirmed that she needed help and the shooter had fired at least 10 rounds. No, I'm, I'm in the house. I'm shooting. I'm shooting. Who's shooting? How many times did you hear shooting? Ten times. Ten times. Do you know where it's coming from? Yeah, I'm shooting. Where's the shooter? I'm shooting. She told them that she was hiding in her closet and needed to whisper to make sure that she wasn't heard. She was worried that if the shooter heard her, then they would come up, find her, and she would be next. The operator dispatched emergency services, and they arrived to find a man climbing out of the basement window. But they saw quite quickly that it was the oldest Kramer son, Anthony. He had been in that basement room where he too had heard gunshots ring out, and then he decided to hide behind a pool table, not knowing what to do. Eventually... He realised he hadn't heard a gunshot for quite some time, so knew he needed to escape. The problem was, he didn't know for sure that the shooter wasn't still inside the house, and so he decided to pull himself up and out that basement window, and that was at the same time as the police officers had began to arrive at the Kramer house, and so he was taken into a police car and to safety. As officers made their way through the house to clear the crime scene, they found numerous bodies. By the front door, Jeffrey was lying on the floor with multiple gunshot wounds. And just a few feet further into the house, lying on the stairs, they found Laurie with similar wounds. And finally, they found Michael lying on the floor near the garage in the back part of the house. All of the families had suffered multiple gunshots to the body and to the head, execution style. They continued through the house to the upstairs where they found Angela still inside of her closet now, the officers told her that they had cleared the house and she could come out, but they needed to make sure that she closed her eyes so she didn't see the horrific brutality of what had happened to her mum, dad and brother. Michael's girlfriend was found safe and uninjured outside of the house and she told officers that she was asleep with Michael on the sofa when she heard a crash coming from the ground floor of the house. The next thing she heard was a gunshot 
And then Michael saying, quote, oh my God. Sarah ran out of the house, managing to actually peep a look at the perpetrator before she escaped. Now, she didn't get a good look at him, especially with the panic and the need for survival, but she did give some basic details on height and build and describe the perpetrator as a man on his own, dressed all in black. But that's all she had. On further investigation of the crime scene, it became clear that a hammer had been used to smash through one of the downstairs windows. They knew it was a hammer because it had been left behind on the floor, and so then that was taken in for forensic testing. The investigating team theorised that after Michael's girlfriend Sarah had started running, the intruder was by this point fully inside of the house and started fighting with Michael, and eventually ended up shooting him dead. It was theorised that because the fighting and gunshots would have made a lot of noise, it woke Laurie and Jeffrey, and they immediately came running down the stairs only to meet with the perpetrator and also be shot dead. This version of events is conflicting to the actual order of events just because it was a theory at the time, but it's only minor and we'll get to that. On further investigation of the crime scene, forensic investigators identified a number of shell casings, as well as very clear footsteps that led from the front door out onto the street into the snow. It was clear that this was not a robbery. Nothing was taken. It was an attack to kill. The detectives had taken Angela Anthony and Sarah's statements all by just after 8am that morning, and they ruled all three of them out. It wasn't long after they'd taken these statements that they were made aware of a phone call that had just come in to 911. A man called Johnny had said that he was concerned because he'd been watching the news that morning and he'd seen that his girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, Angela Kramer, her house and her family had been involved in some kind of incident. He specified that he'd seen there had been some kind of a home invasion and he was worried. And so the operator said that an officer would see him not long after that, Johnny was brought into the station and it was there that he learnt that Angela was alive. She hadn't been shot and she wasn't injured. And by all accounts of the officers present there and then, Johnny seemed relieved. Even so, they obviously had to take a look into his whereabouts on the night of the murder. He told them that he had an alibi. He had been at a casino pretty much all night. The murders had happened at around 3am and he'd been at the casino from 10pm until 4am. The officers checked the CCTV and they confirmed that his alibi completely checked out. There was no way he could have been the murderer. However, police had already gained some information from Johnny's ex-girlfriend, the mother of his child, and the victim's family member, Angela Kramer, and they didn't feel safe letting him go just yet. Angela told them that she and Johnny had broken up just before Christmas, so about two months, two and a bit months earlier, but it had been a long time coming. Johnny had never gotten on well with Angela's family and he had anger issues. After their baby had been born, Johnny became even more possessive and controlling and he would not let Angela see or speak to her family if he could help it. He wanted to be the only person that Angela depended on or confided in and it wasn't long before he began becoming violent and aggressive towards the Kramer family. On one occasion he pulled a knife out on Jeffrey and another time at the baby shower for Johnny and Angela's baby Johnny had really showed his true colours. It was supposed to be just Angela and her girlfriends and her female family members but Johnny had demanded that he was going to go too. He said that if he wasn't there Angela wasn't allowed to go. And so Johnny turned up with Angela and he was pretty angry the entire baby shower. This baby shower was one where the son had already been born and so he was asleep in the baby carrier the whole time and Johnny had become pretty angry and he picked up that carrier with their son in it and used it to bat off Angela's mother and grandmother so that he could leave with their son. Just after the couple broke up, Angela moved back into her parents' house and began pushing for full custody. It's probably no surprise that Johnny didn't actually want to pay child support and he wanted full custody. Because of this information, the investigating team decided to hold Johnny. Despite his airtight alibi, he did have motive and they didn't have any other leads at this point. 
But they also didn't really have enough evidence against Johnny to hold him for long. The state of Illinois has holding regulations that mean that a person can only be held for up to 72 hours or they need to be officially charged. The investigating team desperately needed to find out more and they needed to do it quickly. Police camera footage from the interrogation room where Johnny was being held showed him on his phone calling different people, letting them know what was going on and where he was at and continuously confirming that he had nothing to do with the murders. But that is when police got an idea. They decided to confiscate the phone and see if there was any evidence or anything at all that was on the phone that they might be able to use to progress the case forward. Johnny's phone went in for forensic analysis and they found that he had received phone calls from an unregistered pay-as-you-go mobile phone immediately after the time of the murders. It was suspicious to officers that Johnny would just happen to receive a call at that time, especially as it was 3.10 in the morning. They also managed to bring up a voicemail from someone talking about how they thought they were being followed and that there were a lot of black SUVs following. Quote, Hey Johnny, it's Jake. Gonna have to get rid of phone soon. If you're a friend, Johnny, please call me back. A tip then came into 911 from a man saying that his roommate Jacob had been experiencing extreme paranoia and had just called him from the highway saying that he was being followed and that there were police all around him and this might be the last time he could speak. He also thought that Jacob had sounded as though he was crying. A police soon connected this Jacob guy to be the same Jake who had left the voicemail on Johnny's phone. Jacob was pals with Johnny. The pair had met when he bought drugs from Johnny. And Jacob was also pals with Michael, the son of Laurie and Jeffrey, the third victim in the triple murder. However, Jacob and Michael were no longer friends at the time of the murders. Jacob had lied to Michael about his friendship with Johnny. And after everything Johnny had put the Kramer family through, it's likely Michael just wanted to cut anyone to do with Johnny out of his life. It's reported they had a huge argument on the evening before Thanksgiving and since then, Michael and Jacob just hadn't spoken. As part of their investigation, Jacob's background was looked into. He had no criminal record or anything that flagged at all and so the officers in charge went to visit his grandparents to try and gain more of an insight into him. Both of Jacob's grandparents were very willing to speak with them and... They really believed that Jacob would never have had anything to do with the murders. They confirmed that he had been out of the house that he shared with his mum and dad from the age of 18. And this was because they were extremely religious and he felt controlled. And as well as this, there were allegations that his parents had been physically abusive towards him. He had been gutted though that he'd had to leave his younger sister behind. He was extremely close with her and protective of her. They also let them know that Jacob had been depressed for a while. He had anxiety, he had suicidal tendencies, and he also used drugs to regularly self-medicate. Now, the last they'd seen of Jacob was a few evenings before the murder. Jacob had gone out to dinner with his grandmother, and as far as she was concerned, everything seemed normal. And then 911 operators received a phone call from Jacob himself. This phone call was before the officers had launched any kind of a search, but it's really telling as to Jacob's state of mind. He told the operator that he'd been making his way across state and that he'd seen seven cars, or maybe more, flashing him, and that he'd been followed for a long time in Indiana. He went on to say that he thought it was perhaps undercover officers and asked if the operator could tell him anything, but the operator couldn't. They weren't aware of any officers operating undercover in that area. Not that I'm sure they wouldn't have told him if that was the case and they needed to be undercover. But certainly in hindsight, it's clear that Jacob is experiencing some pretty intense paranoia. As far as the detectives are concerned, they now have a fugitive on the run. And in order to have the best chance at locating him, they sought help from the US Marshal Service. The US Marshals managed to get a search warrant for the phone number that Jacob had used to call Johnny, the pay-as-you-go unregistered one, in other words, a burner phone. They managed to track that phone's movements and locate it traveling through Georgia and towards Florida. They ran through details of who Jacob might know in Florida 
and they found that he had family members in Lehigh Acres and Miami, both in Florida. They called both sets of family members located there and warned about the situation and that Jacob might be on his way. And then the detective got a call from Jacob's parents. They said that he was right outside of their house sleeping in his car. And so they made their way straight there, arrested him and brought him down to the station. In the interrogation room, Jacob confessed that he was scared and he didn't want to say anything in case his family was harmed if he, quote, opened up his mouth. He was worried that if he spoke to investigators, he'd be next. Quote, there was no turning back once it started. Jacob was convinced that the only way to protect his family would be to commit murder. The detectives ensured Jacob that they would keep him safe so long as he told them the truth. And he went on to say that back in summer of 2009, Johnny and Jacob had become closer. It happened to be at the time that Angela and Johnny were having relationship problems to the point where there was already talk of custody battles. Now, when Jacob left his parents, he went to live with Johnny and Johnny demanded that he cut Michael out of his life. Jacob became pretty enamoured with Johnny. The relationship between the pair really reminds me of the relationship between Jesse James Hollywood and Ryan Hoyt. I did a video on the murder of Nick Markowitz where basically Ryan owed money to Jesse James and as a result of this, he became really scared of him and would do almost anything he asked. I think Jacob and Johnny's relationship is very similar to this. Jacob felt he had no choice but to do what Johnny told him to. I'm not excusing his behaviour in any way. The man still has free will and he made the decisions he made. But I also think that Johnny specifically chose someone who was more vulnerable and easily manipulated. Either way, Jacob said that Johnny had told him he was part of a criminal gang that dealt drugs. He built up this world of being in a gang and he'd even take Jacob out to clubs and point at people that were a little too far away to actually go and speak to them, but say that they were members of the gang to the point where Jacob believed that, that there were these people all over. Johnny told Jacob that his ex-girlfriend, the mother of his child, Angela, had learned too much about the gang and their activities and said that she was going to go to that police. Now, for that reason, he said Angela had to be eliminated and he needed Jacob to be the one to kill Angela and her brother, Michael. He added that if anyone got in the way, he would need to kill them too. Jacob said it wasn't just him who had been ordered to murder on that night. Johnny told him that beyond Angela, there were more people who had information and knew too much about the gang and their activities and they were going to expose them. So they had to be taken out on the same night. In fact... Johnny said he was going to be doing the exact same thing, as well as a number of the other gang members. But detectives informed Jacob that this just wasn't true. Not only did Johnny have an alibi, but there were also no other murders committed on the evening that could be related in any way in that area. It seemed that Jacob had been lied to and he'd murdered three people because of it. There was no question that Jacob had committed these murders. By now, in the interview process, he was outright admitting it. But the detectives wanted to gather more information specifically relating to Johnny. He told detectives that not only had Johnny literally mapped out the Kramer's family home and showed him the exact window that he would need to smash to gain entry. And Angela had previously said in her statement to police that Johnny had been in the house a number of times and knew it well. But Jacob went on to say that Johnny had directed him on which gun to buy, on which store to buy it from. And CCTV footage showed Jacob purchasing a 40 caliber handgun from a sports shop just a few days before the murder. The reality of what had happened that night was that Jacob had broken that window that Johnny had directed him to. He'd gained entry into the house. And on hearing this, Michael had run into the kitchen and his girlfriend Sarah, as we know, escaped through the door. By this point, what with all the commotion, Jeffrey had come downstairs and that is when Jacob had pulled the trigger, shooting him in the torso. As Jeffrey went down, Jacob could see Laurie on the stairs just behind him. So he then shot her in the torso before heading back to the kitchen where Michael was trying to pick up knives to throw them towards this intruder. But knives are no match for a gun. 
And so Jacob shot Michael a number of times before heading back to his first two victims, where he then shot them both in the back of the head. He didn't hesitate to say that Johnny had given him instructions to check the whole house, but he says he didn't check the basement, and that is why Anthony wasn't shot. And although he had gone to check the bedrooms, he did he did actually check Angela's bedroom. He did not check the closet that Angela was hiding in, and so she was able to survive. He immediately left the house, went a few streets over, and managed to get in his car, and then headed to Florida. At this point in the investigation, they had been holding Johnny for about 60 hours. And so they only have 12 hours left to make sure they've got as much evidence as possible before charging him. They managed to get a search warrant to Johnny's apartment where Jacob had been staying, but they couldn't find the gun. But Jacob was beginning to understand that the reality Johnny had fed to him wasn't even close to the truth. And he'd been well and truly fooled. And so he gave up the exact location of the gun, directing the team to a commercial trash bin outside of a restaurant. They did manage to find the gun, as well as clothing and a bag, and they tested that gun and found it matched the shell casings found at the crime scene. It seems that because of the mountains of evidence piling up, albeit mainly from one source, they did manage to get an extension for holding Johnny, hoping that he might slip up or tell them something useful. But he did keep maintaining his innocence. However, the detectives placed Johnny and Jacob in adjoining cells whilst they waited for the next steps. And what Johnny likely didn't know, or at the very least had forgotten, was that in Illinois, the cells that they were placed in had working microphones. And so with these conversations between Johnny and Jacob, they were all being recorded. Johnny spoke about the evidence, he spoke specifically about where Jacob had dumped the gun, and he asked him questions about specific parts of their plan. Johnny made sure that Jacob knew he was about to get out, and he had contacts on the inside, and Jacob better not talk or else. It's unsurprising that Johnny was finally charged on the 6th of March with three counts of homicide. In 2011, Jacob pleaded guilty to three counts of homicide, and so his case didn't need to go to trial, and he was sentenced to 75 years. He addressed Angela, quote, Angela, I'm so incredibly sorry from what I took from you. I know there is no way I can understand your pain. I hope you will be reunited with your loved ones in paradise forever. There are no words for how sorry I am for what I've done to you. The 2013 trial for Johnny went ahead and the prosecution called Jacob to testify on the stand where he said that he was told by Johnny to, quote, put one bullet in each of their heads to make sure that they are dead. Johnny was found guilty on all three counts of homicide and as well as that, he was convicted of solicitation to murder and he was given three consecutive life sentences with no possibility of parole. Johnny's mother stands firm in the belief that her son was framed. Quote, This is not the first or last time in our broken system an innocent man will be sent to prison, but I'll have to believe for one day when he's back in my arms. I couldn't find any evidence for this uh, framing theory. Angela said, quote, I am a victim and my family are victims of such a senseless crime that I'm here today to say we will no longer be victims. After today, I'm going to go on happily with my life. Thank you for watching this episode of Red Rum. Apologies, I'm still not very well, so uh, my voice isn't great. So I hope the vocal quality is okay. Um, I will be back next week. Hopefully I'll be well as well. Uh, so I'll see you then for another episode of Red Rum. Bye.